Hello students, now begins an introductory lesson for the acid-base equilibria unit, which is unit two in our Zumdahl supplementary red books. This video will give an overview of the general properties of acids and bases, as well as our go-to definition of acids and bases. It will compare and contrast strong and weak acids, specifically related to this idea of Ka. In your class packet, I included this introductory summary of the concepts that actually this first video will cover. So I encourage you to go over this after the video, just as a confirmation of, of everything that, that we've talked about. And I can, of course, address your questions on any of this in class. All right, so digging in. And please forgive the pun, but the basic or general definitions of acids and bases. So it's pretty w widely known that acids, if tasted, are sour, and bases, of course, bitter. We know that we're not to come into direct contact with acids and bases in the laboratory setting, but throughout our daily life, we encounter acids and bases, and bases, when touched, give the sensation of slippery. Actually, um, the base reacts with the oil and fat that's exuded through your skin to create soap, hence the sensation of, of being slippery, so you're actually experiencing that reaction. Where acids, as long as they are not injuring your tissue, just feel wet, but we won't. Give, give a descriptive term there. Acids, of course, have pH values below 7. Bases are above 7. So just shy of 7 um, will be acidic and then above 7 base. And then the terms that we use to describe the reactive behavior of an acid is that it is corrosive. Where bases, we use the term caustic. If you read the directions for a liquid plumber, if the active ingredient is sodium hydroxide, a base, it will say danger caustic ingredients. So if used properly, caustic describes um, the reactivity, the behavior that bases show us and acids um, corrosive. There are several definitions of acids and bases. So numerous chemists assembled materials that had these properties and then tried to really come up with um, a definitive definition. What makes something sour, pH below seven, and so on? Well, the definition that you probably have learned and have applied through middle school has been the Arrhenius definition. But actually, this is a, a little limiting for us. And the Lewis definition, we will expand upon um, as we learn some other concepts like a complex ion and things like that. So the go-to definition for us from this point forward will be the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Two individuals, Bronsted and Lowry, were working on this definition, but we collapsed and, and credited them together um, through the, the name. A Bronsted-Lowry acid, I'm just going to abbreviate it, <clears throat> B slash L, is known most simply as a proton donor and a Bronsted-Lowry base as a proton acceptor. So where is this idea of a proton coming in? Well, if we have a hydrogen atom, <coughs> the hydrogen atom is made of one proton, the most abundant form of hydrogen. Protium has zero neutrons, but one electron to be neutral. Well, when it becomes an ion and loses the electron, to form the plus one cation, it is simply the proton. So a single proton is synonymous with a hydrogen ion. So the Bronsted-Lowry acid, we could say, is a hydrogen ion donor, and then a Bronsted-Lowry base is a hydrogen ion acceptor. They're one in the same. So let's apply these definitions. An acid, we say, is, is not really an acid until it's interacted with water. So it doesn't show us the properties that it has um, until it ionizes. And we know that acids, let's take the most popular well-known acid, HCl, um, 
chemically is transformed in the presence of water. It reacts with it. Being a strong acid, I'm going to first just put the full reaction arrow to the right. And we know this ionization process creates H3O plus and then the chloride ion. So we've gone over this before. In chapter four, we said acids ionize, react with water to create hydronium, and then we'll get the anion that remains when the acid has lost the hydrogen. Well, Bronsted Lowry would say it's doing that because acids donate the hydrogen ion. So the HCl is becoming chloride. It gave the hydrogen ion to water to allow it to transform into hydronium. So here, HCl is behaving as a Bronsted Lowry acid. And here, water is behaving as a Bronsted Lowry base because it accepted that hydrogen ion. Let's take a look at one of our go-to examples of a weak acid, acetic acid. Now being an acid, it will donate the hydrogen ion to water, but being a weak acid, I should put the double arrows, and we will get hydronium. Well, if this lost the hydrogen ion, then the other product will be the acetate ion. We're believing that all of this happens in water, so the phase symbols I should place are liquid, aqueous, 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 and then aqueous, aqueous, liquid, and aqueous. Now, we talked about in our first equilibrium unit that really it's most correct if we put all reaction arrows as reverse. And we know that we could be grandly favoring right, like in the case of a strong acid, but depending on the concentration, these may collide again and, and form some of the reactant back. So even though this would be grandly favoring right, it's most correct to show this as a double arrow. Okay, if we see the HCl transformed to be chloride, well, those are actually pairs, and the water became hydronium. Well, the acetate here, we would say, became, I'm sorry, the acetic acid became acetate, so the pair would be that, and then water and hydronium. Okay. Well, these are what we call conjugate acid-base pairs. And I want to talk about why. All right. So clearly, HCl donating the hydrogen ion. It is behaving as an acid. If we look actually at the reverse process, so let's imagine that these are reactant forming these as product. Well, the chloride then is accepting the hydrogen ion to form HCl. So the chloride is behaving as a base and the hydronium is donating to form water then. It is behaving as an acid. Hmm. So what behaves as an acid as a reactant forms base as product and vice versa. Well, how about here? The HCl is forming, I'm sorry, the HC2H3O2 is forming acetate. It lost the hydrogen ion, behaving as an acid. In the reverse, this would be a base. The H2O, behaving as a base, is accepting the hydrogen ion from acetic acid to form this. In the reverse direction, this is giving up the hydrogen ion to acetate to form water. Hmm, conjugate acid-base pairs. So we would say that chloride is the conjugate base of HCl, or that HCl is the conjugate acid of the chloride ion as a base. Well, conjugate acid-base pairs actually have three requirements. Well, one, they only differ composition-wise um, by a hydrogen ion. Again, formula-wise. So if we take a look at all of these, they only differ by H+. So for example, H2O and chloride would never be a conjugate acid-base pair, or the hydronium ion and hydroxide. Th those would never. They differ more than the hydrogen ion. Also, conjugate acid-base pairs are on opposite sides of the reaction arrow. One is a reactant, and one is a product. The third is that they are 
opposite in their strength. Which I'll talk about more what that means um, in, in just a moment. All right. So we know whenever we have a system in equilibria that we can describe where the equilibrium position is with a K expression. So for this reaction, it would be concentration of hydronium times the concentration of chloride over the concentration of HCl. Note, water does not play a role because it's in the liquid state. And for this, it would be hydronium acetate as well over acetic acid. Again, water does, does not show up. This is what acids do. They ionize. They react with water to liberate the hydrogen ion to create hydronium. And then what is the conjugate base? Sometimes we refer to acid behavior generically by just writing HA, where hydrogen would be the ionized proton and this would be the anion. Now here, these are just monoprotic acids. They only have one ionizable hydrogen, where something like H2SO4 would be diprotic. It has two ionizable hydrogens, and we'll talk about that more to come. So I could write a monoprotic acid just as HA, where I would write generically sulfuric as H2A because it has two ionizable hydrogens, but again, we'll get to that later. When HA reacts with water, if it's behaving as an acid, then we know it's gonna form the hydronium ion and then the conjugate base, which I can just refer to generically as A minus. So the K expression generically is the hydronium ion times the um, conjugate base over the, um, the acid at equilibrium, of course. This be describes the behavior of acids. This is what acids do, Braun said Lowry. They donate the hydrogen ion, forming hydronium and the conjugate base. So these we denote, because it's describing the behavior of an acid as reactant, as Ka, Ka expressions. Now, we're gonna have to be forgiven, forgiving, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, the Ka expression is officially called the acid dissociation constant. Well, we know this isn't dissociation. This is ionization. So we need to lobby and, and get it properly renamed, but we'll be understanding. So we'll just refer to it as Ka. Um, and here's you know the generic um, representation. All right, now, water does not show up in the Ka expression. So there's a little shortcut that we've developed. We can actually, even though we know it's there, we would never have ionization without it, we can actually kind of shortcut and just say, okay, when this ionizes, we know it's gonna liberate the hydrogen ion. But that, of course, will couple with water, and then the conjugate base will be liberated. Now we know that that does not exist independent in solution. It really is hydronium, but we can kind of cheat and just write the hydrogen ion. So another way you could write Ka is just the hydrogen ion concentration times the conjugate base over HA. Even though we know water is really there, it is really your choice to write it in or not. Now, a, a nice thing, acids only liberate one hydrogen ion at a time. So for acid-base reactions, these will all be one to one to one to one mole ratio. So our um, exponents will always be um, power of one. Very nice, very nice, very nice. All right, well, um, what else you know, do we know about strong acids versus um, weak acids? Well, if we recall back, so right now um, in our class packet, you know, kind of working through this, now um, to the back here. So, all right. The strength of an acid is most properly 
determined by the position of the ionization equilibria. All right, so we know our strong acids. You need to know these. Beware of HF. So if we start with HCl, we know we can just go down the halogens, and then we have HBr, and then HI, and then HNO3, H2SO4, and HClO4. So hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, nitric, sulfuric, and perchloric. Now some um, textbooks will include HClO3, chloric acid, as a seventh strong, but this is these are the six that the College Board and um, Zomdahl holds us accountable for. Okay, what makes a strong acid a strong acid? Remember, it involves 100% ionization. So, whatever the concentration is of that strong acid, let's say um, 8 molar, all of it, we say ionizes, although properly we should put the double arrows. So, If that's our initial, water doesn't show up in our ice table, well then we would say that at equilibria, we're going to have complete ionization. Even though we write this, we recognize the Ka is going to grandly, grandly favor product. It's going to be much greater than one. In fact, most textbooks just say very large. For those six. In fact, it, it just wouldn't be appropriate to do an ice table because we know that this is going to be so close to the original concentration of, of the acid. We're weak acid, so any acid that's not one of these six, we know only partially ionizes. And it's so interesting that there's no in-between. Um, you know, usually one to three percent is what we say. You're either fully ionized or just slightly. So something like HF, again, it's up to you if you want to write water or not. I will go ahead. You know, we would pursue this um, with an ice table because even if we have um, a one molar HF solution, um, you know, at equilibria, we're, we're only going to have a, a fraction of, of that. So we would predict that the Ka values for weak acids um, you know, are, are going to be are going to be um, much less than one. Um, usually, you ten to the negative third, ten to the negative fifth, or so. All right. So, if I could go back to, well, what do we mean that a conjugate acid-base pair is opposite in the strength? Well, if we would, you know, look at just these two reactions. Um, Yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. I just, I'm sorry, I had to pause it and think about this. Um, all right, we know that HCl is one of our strong acids. It's one of our six. And acetic is not one of the six, and so we would absolutely call it a weak acid. Well, the conjugate base of a strong acid is weak. The stronger the acid, the weaker the base. All right, so what do we mean, the, the weaker the base compared to what? Well, that's compared to the strength of water behaving as a base. Remember, bases except the hydrogen ion. So, the stronger the acid, the weaker the base. So we're saying that chloride, in its ability to um, accept the hydrogen ion, so its strength as a hydrogen ion acceptor, is less than the strength of water as a hydrogen ion acceptor. And then acetic as a weak acid, well, the weaker the acid, the stronger the conjugate base. Well, that just means that acetate, um, the strength of it as a hydrogen ion acceptor is stronger than water as a hydrogen ion acceptor. You know, some um, chemists say that the position of equilibrium can also be dictated by the base strength. So here, water um, is a much stronger base than chloride, so it is doing a better job holding on to the hydrogen ion, making the equilibrium favor right more. Where here, it's 
acetate that's stronger than water. So its ability to hold on to the hydrogen ion is much stronger, predominantly causing this um, equilibrium to favor reactant. Just um, a, a beautiful little um, particulate diagram that your book shows on page 632, um, your actual textbook. I just think this is a really nice um, representation of you know initial concentration of a strong acid and then after ionization. So the levels, the, the height is concentration. We know 100% ionization. We no longer see any of the original acid molecules. They've all been ionized. Where here, if it's a weak acid, only one of these is showing any um, liberation of that hydrogen ion. The others are staying as a molecule. So a, a very nice graphic for us. And so just to finish, um, this table um, summarizes and so you should be able to go through yourself and fill this out. So if you wanna pause and just make sure that what I've written here makes sense. So strong acid versus weak acid. And here we're talking about the hydrogen ion concentration at equilibria. So if we're saying strong acids completely ionize, then the concentration at equilibria is equal to the initial concentration of the acid in water. But a weak acid, no, you get um, very little production or liberation of that hydrogen ion. Um, and then strength of comparative um, conjugate bases. All right, please take a look back at your notes, read over um, the wording that Zumdahl gives you and that first review sheet. Thank you.